welcome to today's uh, lunchtime seminar. For those who don't know me, I'm Diana Safati. I'm the director of the Cancer Control and Screening Research Group. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jason Gurney, who's a research fellow who's also working within the Cancer Control and Screening Research Group. Um, he came to us at the end of 2010, and his background was actually in biomechanics, but he's taken to his new field like a duck to water, and now he's dealing with routine health data like a pro, which is why he's now today talking on the use of routine healthcare data in New Zealand. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Jason. Thanks very much, Di. It's uh, lovely to be here to talk to you all about uh, routine healthcare data. As Di said, I, I come from a biomechanics background, um, so I guess it's probably good to start with this. I'm, it's my goal to somehow fit in my biomechanics background into everything that I do. So my background is actually in diabetic foot biomechanics. Um, this is a foot that's uh, very clearly ulcerated, uh, and the, the, the bi biomechanics has a, a big uh, role to play in preventing uh, this from happening. And uh, I guess the difference between biomechanics and epidemiology, uh, and from my perspective, has been getting used to uh, the different sources and the different um, methods of collecting data. So for example, this uh, diabetic foot here, a way that we might prevent that from happening would be to collect uh, some plantar pressure data. And this is a plantar pressure distribution system which uh, a diabetic patient would walk over and it would tell us straight away what sort of pressures were happening beneath uh, the diabetic foot. And it quantifies very precisely uh, exactly uh, the, what those pressures are. For example, an A4 size platform would have 2,500 sensors in it, uh, and it's also a highly reliable uh, system. So to come from biomechanics to epidemiology was really to uh, kind of expand my focus. <laughs> so I've, I've actually kind of made biomechanics bigger than it really should be. It, would, it, it really is just a speck when you compare it to uh, epidemiology. It is uh, still important, and, I, and I, I, it's not uh, this isn't a gauge of importance, but if we try to contextualise the size of epidemiology uh, and compare it to the very narrow focus of biomechanics, that's, that's sort of where I've come from. And I guess uh, my responsibility is uh, coming on as a research fellow into uh, an epidemiology uh, research group was to very quickly find out where is this data we're using coming from? How is it collected? Um, so for me, having done so much highly focused lab-based research where we worry about error to the nth degree, um, getting my head around uh, the possible sources of error and the sources of the data that we're using in EPI. Uh, there's a few sort of key goals for today, uh, mainly to overview the routine health data sets, to discuss uh, some of their strengths and weaknesses, uh, to present some possible data sources to augment these routine data sets, and also just a little bit uh, of uh, horizon, blue sky looking, to discuss the future of uh, these routine data sets. Uh, I guess it would be good to start off with the uh, realisation that I'm coming at it from one perspective. So I've only worked in cancer epidemiology, that's all I've done. So being aware that I have my own set of biases, because there are people in this room that will be using this data for completely different reasons. So understanding that that's my bias uh, might give you a better, better idea of the lens that I'm looking through uh, to discuss these routine data sets. So the Ministry of Health data collections obviously are kept and maintained by the Ministry of Health, and they're based on reporting from healthcare providers, principally the DHBs. Uh, if you left right now, it would and as long as you're left with the take-home message of they're kept for administrative purposes, you'd at least get something out of today. Because that kind of gives you an idea about some of the challenges that we face with using these routine data sets in epidemiology. They are administrative data sets first and foremost. They're intended to monitor the health of our population and the performance of our healthcare system, but we must always remember research is not their primary objective. There is no single data set. Instead, there are multiple data sets which all serve uh, different functions. Now, this has its positives uh, and its negatives. From one point of view, it does sort of split things into bite-sized pieces so we can understand concepts such as cancer using the cancer registry. Uh, but it has its weakness in that there's no centralised data set that we can use 
to look at some sort of continuity of care as a patient moves through sort of the treatment pathway. I'm going to discuss a few of the collections today, but obviously not all of them. Uh, it would take far too long to do that. Uh, these are some of the collections that I'm not going to discuss today. And it's not because they're not important, but depending on what your research question is, they could be uh, very important. Uh, but those, these ones aren't going to be discussed today. For example, the National Maternity Collection is uh, something we're going to be using uh, in an upcoming study. And it's uh, apparently very good. We say apparently because we've used it. Uh, at looking at uh, prenatal and neonatal hospitalisation events and records around birth. Uh, the National Booking Reporting System is a record of all people that are on a waiting list uh, and how long they've been on that waiting list. The primed mental health data set I can't speak to, but uh, I'm, I'm assured that there's, there's pretty high hopes for that data set and being able to uh, be quite cutting edge in terms of uh, a routine data set from which uh, epidemiology research can be done into mental health. But today I want to focus on the data sets that matter to me now. <laughs> so that's, that's these five uh, data sets that we're using a lot in uh, our C3 studies, the, Net, the New Zealand Cancer Registry, the National Minimum Data Set, the Pharmaceutical Claims Collection, National Non-Admitted Patient Collection and Mortality Collection. And I want to discuss these in the context of research that's currently underway within the Cancer Control and Screening Research Group, principally uh, the C3 studies which uh, are funded by HRC. As you know, Cancer Control and Screening Research Group is directed by uh, DAI. It's a highly collaborative group of academics and clinicians. And we have several research projects which are currently underway. But today I want to use the C3 studies as our platform to discuss the routine data sets. Uh, there's two C3 studies, the C3 Qual study, which is uh, headed up by Louise Signal, and the C3 Quant study, which is headed up by DAI. Uh, I'm a research fellow on the C3 Quant study. And we're looking at the effect of comorbidity uh, on care and survival inequalities between Māori and non-Māori. So in order to conduct this study, we needed to use some routine data. What did we need? Well, we, for, for a start, we needed a cohort. We needed some patients. Uh, these are nine cancers uh, that we're interested in in the context of our study, uh, mainly for a, uh, from an inequalities perspective. Uh, and we needed to be able to define where those cohorts uh, what those cohorts were. We needed to know their comorbidities, which is their conditions other than their primary cancer. We needed to know uh, their treatment, so we needed to know their surgery. In, in the context of cancer, that essentially means surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy. And we needed to know their survival. So we can sort of start walking through the things that we needed for the C3 studies and where we used the routine hospitalization data. So to define our cohort, we need to use the New Zealand Cancer Registry. The New Zealand Cancer Registry is a register of all new primary malignancies in New Zealand. Uh, the primary source of data is laboratories, and therefore cancers are generally histologically confirmed, but that's not always the case. Some data are also derived from coroner's reports and hospital discharge data. In a nutshell, the Cancer Registry includes data on the patient, so patient demographics, the diagnosis, so the date and facility where a diagnosis was made, and uh, some critical information about the tumour, so the site of the tumour, its morphology, the extent of disease or stage, and some more cancer-specific variables, uh, for example, in breast cancer with estrogen receptor status. For our study, uh, C3Quant, we used NZCR for identifying patients with one of our nine cancers of interest. We also used tumour data to exclude some patients that were diagnosed with a certain morphology of cancer. For example, this was important for our stomach cancer cohort where some morphology uh, characteristics of stomach cancer are treated completely different to the other stomach cancers, so we had to exclude those. We then uh, used uh, the cancer registry to link these patients by NHI to other Ministry of Health data collections. So when you hear the term uh, linked data sets, I guess that can be kind of an example of, of that. This is just an example of NZCR data. I didn't break any ethics rules. This, I completely fabricated this patient. 
Uh, BCA4321 is a 55-year-old woman with breast cancer, which is this ICD coding C50. Uh, of duct carcinoma morphology, 8500 here, which is spread to the lymph nodes, which is extent of disease D. So that's an example of what the data might look like with some selected columns. The Cancer Registry has a number of strengths. It's a requirement that all new malignancies are reported to the Cancer Registry, so it's a very complete record of cancer incidents in New Zealand. Uh, for our context, it provided a very good platform for us to link to other data sets. Obviously, uh, that's going to be uh, more applicable for cancer researchers, but for our, from our perspective, it, it was very worthwhile in that regard. And some research done uh, within the research group has shown the accuracy of the NZCR and colon cancer patients to be uh, reasonably high in terms of age of diagnosis, uh, overall tumour site and tumour subsite. But it has its weaknesses. For a start, it excludes all basal and squamous uh, cell skin cancers. And because histological confirmation is required, months might elapse before a diagnosis is registered. And we also come to this uh, issue of staging. Tumour staging may not always be accurately reported. There's lots of reasons for why this may be the case, but it's a critical consideration when you, when you start looking at cancer registry data. This is uh, very provisional data, so not for citation, but this is the top 18 most prevalent cancers between 2006 and 2008, excluding in situ and secondary tumours, as well as lymphoma and leukaemia, which have unusual staging characteristics. What we found is uh, the proportion of patients who uh, unstaged diagnosis forms a, a kind of strange clustering. We have a group of cancers up the top here with 73%, between 65 and 73% of patients unstaged, sort of one forming in the middle here between 35 and 42, and then one down the bottom here, 14 uh, down to 2. So this is kind of the, a, a topic of discussion within the research group at the moment about what's going on here, and it's going to be a topic of discussion when we meet with our clinical advisors next Monday. Because there probably is a, 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 reasonable, a, a good reason for why this is the case, but we need to break down why that might be. But it highlights the fact that uh, the extent of disease field essentially is the most complete field with respect to staging that you can get from the cancer registry. So if you're relying on the staging from the cancer registry to define where, your cohort, where a patient in your cohort is or what extent of disease they have, depending on which cancer you're taking, it may or may not be giving you the complete picture. Some considerations. New primary cancer doesn't mean the patient had this, hasn't had the same cancer before. So say our patient BCA4321 could have had breast cancer five years ago, gone into remission, and then uh, got another breast cancer. So this would be registered as a completely new incidence. And unless you had uh, information about whether or not that patient had had cancer before, you might be thinking that or treating this patient as a unique uh, diagnosis. So that's a cancer registry in a nutshell. So back to what we needed for the C3 quant study. We needed a cohort. Check. We used the cancer registry for that, and it was very good. We needed to know their comorbidities, again, conditions other than their primary cancer. And for this, we used the national minimum data set and the pharmaceutical collection. The national minimum data set is a collection of data which describes all inpatient events in New Zealand. The primary source of data is hospitals, primarily public hospitals, because they must report by law. Private hospitals are not mandated to report now, most do, but there's some notable exceptions, but we'll get to that later. The NMDS includes data on the patient, so their date of birth, other demographic information, uh, location and key dates, so event start dates, event end dates, uh, treatment dates, diagnoses, so each hospitalisation has up to 20 fields where you can fill that with all the diagnoses that were made during that hospitalisation, and their treatment. So it has this lovely ICD coding of all the treatments that were provided to the patient, ranging from uh, a colonoscopy investigation right through to the anaesthetic they needed before they had uh, some sort of operation. So for C3Quant, we're using the NMDS to exclude patients from our cohort. So for example, to look for previous diagnoses of the same cancer. 
if we think back to the cancer registry problem we were talking about before about having unique identifications, this is where this comes into play. We can look for previous diagnoses up to umpteen years beforehand and see if any of the same primary cancers were diagnosed. We can also check the date of diagnosis and take the earliest. As I discussed before, the cancer registry has a little bit of a lag because, or can have a little bit of a lag. So we can go into the NMDS and find out the first time at which cancer was actually clinically diagnosed. Of course there's a margin of error around that because uh, the cancer registry prides itself on being histologically confirmed, but that's the direction we went. We can identify comorbid conditions, and the NMDS data set has been shown to be valid in this respect by uh, Diane co-authors. And we can identify treatments that uh, were received as an inpatient. And with respect to cancer, when you're talking about the NMDS data set, this generally means surgery. This is a, a little example of uh, our, our breast cancer patients, uh, some NMDS data for them. So she was admitted to Wellington Hospital, which is this facility here, on the 21st of January. She was noted to be an insulin-dependent diabetic. This is this code here, E1090. And she had a unilateral mastectomy with radical lymph node removal under general anesthetic, which is this code here. And she was discharged six days later. Fortunately, she was admitted two days later in a hypoglycemic coma, which is this here, E1100. So you can see how, by linking these data sets together, you can start to pay, paint a picture of a patient's pathway through care. The NMDS does have its strengths. All publicly funded healthcare facilities have to report information to the NMDS. And it does have efficient ICD coding, we can't forget this. Those poor clinical coders sitting in those rooms have to interpret all of that clinical notes and, and find a code for it. And I've, I've been around there and seen them all sitting in their offices. It's not an easy job. It's tricky to do. But that does introduce a margin of error. The accurate coding of data is dependent on the clarity of medical notes as interpreted by the clinical coders. Private hospitals are not mandated to report to the NMDS, and therefore it doesn't give us a complete picture and may introduce differential bias if used as a sole data source. As way of explanation, if you think about the research question we're trying to answer in C3, it's the difference between Māori and non-Māori in terms of treatment equality, survival. Straight away, that should flag up, well, Māori are going to access private treatment less than non-Māori. So we need to make sure that we have provisions for that. For the C3 study, we looked at this, and for the C3 study, NMDS undercounted the proportion of our Auckland colon cancer patients who received definitive surgery. And the reason that the colon cancer uh, patients are important here is because colon cancer, a large proportion of colon cancers are treated privately. So it was important for us to be able to get robust data for that. And the reason we went to Auckland is that one of the major private hospitals, which I won't mention, in the Auckland region is a non-reporting private facility. So when I said that most private facilities do report, they don't. Uh, Thankfully, they were all too happy to come on board and help us out with some data. So this gives you an idea of the undercounting or the, the magnitude of the undercount that the NMDS is doing. So if we were just to use the NMDS data to look for our colon cancer uh, definitive surgeries, we would undercount by about 12%. So just by adding that private hospital data for the Auckland region, we were able to make our data set a bit more uh, robust. So cutting forward now to, from the NMDS to the pharmaceutical collection. Pharmaceutical collection is a collection of data on claims and payments for subsidised prescriptions. And it's used for managing drug subsidies in New Zealand. The primary source of data is pharmacists, and it's jointly owned by uh, the Ministry and Pharmac. Farms includes data on the patient, so a bit of information around whether or not they're a high user, if they've got a community services card, it gives uh, reasonably detailed information about the drug itself, so the chemical family the drug comes from, as well as the formulation, which will tell you how much of the active ingredient is in the drug. And it will tell you about the claim, so the dose and the quantity which has been dispensed. And of principal importance to the farms data set, it will tell you the cost. Now for C3Quant, we're using farms for quite uh, a unique slash unusual uh, measure which is to give us a bit more of a multiple informants approach to this concept of comorbidity. And so we're calculating this thing called Rx risk, which is a pharmacy-based measure of comorbidity. 
It uses pharmaceutical prescriptions to define the presence of comorbid conditions. So in practice, we're linking patients from our cohort by NHI, extracting all of their subsidised prescriptions, and then calculating the Rx risk score. Now obviously there's some intermediary steps in there, but uh, that's in a, in a nutshell. Uh, to give you an example of what the farms data might look like, our breast cancer patient with diabetes was prescribed insulin, which is this one here, to be injected once per day, or, th or thereabouts, to manage their blood glucose levels. And they filled the same prescription two months later. In the absence of any other data, according to this Rx risk measure, we could make an assumption that BCA4321 may have an insulin-dependent diabetic condition. So it's not the be-all and end-all. We don't necessarily use this as the be-all and end-all for defining whether or not someone has, one, has this condition. But if you're using a multiple informants approach, it's quite nice. The pharmaceutical collection has its strengths. It's a comprehensive collection of formulations, dosages, and quantities of drugs dispensed. If you think about how many drugs are dispensed every day in this country, it's no mean feat. It offers us an opportunity to calculate this Rx risk score, which is a unique and validated measure of uh, comorbidity. It may capture diagnoses that we miss from other data sources. Think about our breast cancer patient. Say, for example, uh, she was never diagnosed in an inpatient capacity with her insulin-dependent diabetes, we might be able to catch uh, the fact that she had that condition from the farms collection. It's perfectly suited to fulfill the task required of it. I put a dot, dot, dot there because that's a strength of the data set, but not necessarily a strength for us, because it's the perfect example of a data collection which is not designed with research in mind. It only contains data on subsidised drugs. So from Pharmax perspective, that's perfect, but from our perspective, it's not. Take, for example, LOSEC. A few years ago, it was uh, removed as the subsidised drug and replaced with a, uh, another drug. Now, a patient that had been taking LOSEC might have had some problem with the generic drug that took over its place, so they went back and started paying for their own LOSEC. It would appear, according to the pharmaceutical collection, that that patient stopped taking uh, anti-reflux drugs, but they didn't. They just switched to a non-subsidised one. So making those sorts of conclusions can be erroneous. And it's only just recently expanded to include hospital pharmacies. So from our perspective, we were a bit annoyed about that because if you capture the hospital pharmacies, you might be able to capture some oral chemotherapeutics. Uh, but unfortunately, that's only started in about 2009 from, our, from what we could gather. So that's a pharmaceutical collection. So back to what we needed. We needed a cohort, check, got that from the NZCR. The comorbidities, got that from the NMDS. We also got the surgery from the NMDS. But what we really need now is to finish this sort of uh, treatment trifecta with uh, understanding the chemotherapy and radiotherapy treatment. And for that, the most obvious thing for us to use was the National Non-Admitted Patient Collection. The National Non-Admitted Patient Collection is a collection of data which describes all outpatient and emergency department events in New Zealand. It's used for reimbursing DHBs for services and monitoring outpatient activity. Again, the primary source of data is DHBs, and private outpatient service providers are not mandated to report. NMPAC includes data on the patient, so again, demographics, location of, uh, locations and dates, so dates of services, the facility where the service was provided, and quote unquote, the event, which is has this lovely name of purchase unit code. And that, that includes pretty much everything you can get uh, from that NMPAC record on what actually took place with varying levels of specificity. So for C3Quant, we're using NMPAC to identify outpatient treatments for our cohort. Chemo and radiotherapy are generally provided as outpatient services, so it becomes kind of a necessity that we use it for this, this, in this regard. It also uh, has this kind of secondary, or un potentially unintended benefit, beneficial use for us, which is tracking the outpatient uh, activity of our cohort. For three of our cancers, liver, stomach, and rectal cancer, we were aware before, at the get-go that they would have poor staging data. And so we conducted a clinical notes review because staging, getting the stage right is, is of critical importance to us. NMPAC really helped us guide, guide ourselves around the North Island, which is where the notes review happened, to find those notes. So if you can imagine a patient that, say, uh, was born and bred in, in Tauranga, uh, they might have some treatment there, but then move back up to Auckland or go to Auckland to get some sort of outpatient services they can't get in Tauranga. So we know then that we need to go to Tauranga to get that patient's notes, but we also need to go to Auckland. So it was helpful in that respect. 
As an example of NMPACT data, we can see our breast cancer patient following the surgery that we saw in the NMDS data was treated with uh, chemotherapy, which is M5004, at Wellington Hospital, which is 5811. And they could have multiple service dates. They could have 30 rows of data. So strengths to the NMPAC. It's a brief slide. Uh, it does offer us that opportunity that I talked about of following a patient a long pathway of care. And it, it really is the only player in the game in terms of um, Ministry of Health data collection that will allow us to do that. And it does include things like nurse appointments, surgical consults, etc. But when I tried to think of other strengths, the tumbleweed rolling across a ghost town came to mind because there really aren't any more tangible ones that I can get. It's another great example of a data set which was designed purely for administrative purposes. I mean, think of the term purchase unit code. I mean, it offers no information about the diagnosis for a start and only very little information about the treatment. So, for example, that M5004 code that we looked at before tells us nothing about the chemotherapy regime that they're on. All that literally stands for is uh, chemotherapy treatment. That's it. It's also well known by the ministry's own admission. They're the first, first to say this, that it's, going to be in a, that it's an incomplete data set. And this is thought to be due to underreporting by DHBs. In C3, we've found that the NMPAC data set does undercount chemo and radiotherapy treatment provision. This is uh, a highly kind of specialised or focused look, just to illustrate a point. Uh, this is all patients with stage 3 breast cancer residing in Auckland. And this is the effect of the different data sets on whether or not it's, it was, we found that they had received chemotherapy, definitive chemotherapy. The reason we look at stage 3 is because, uh, more often than not, that's a, a set definitive treatment. They should all get chemotherapy. So if we were to just look at the NMPAC data set alone, you can see the sort of undercount that we're getting. We get our, our friends at the Can Auckland Cancer Centre to give us data. It jumps takes a big jump. We get our friends at the Breast Cancer Register to give us even more data. It jumps again. And then when you combine them all, it jumps even just a little bit more. And you get this 20%, magnitude of 20% offset between the NMPAC alone and all of those extra data sets. Now again, I must emphasize that this is a very specific example. This is one region, one cancer, one stage, but it kind of illustrates the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. So the, the farm data set? Yeah. To get the chemotherapy? Yeah, so for this is so this is for our period of interest, 06 to 08, in which case the farms was only community based. Yeah. So so now the hospital based farms should be should be getting better, but it's too soon to tell how much better it'll be. I certainly hope so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's potential. I mean, I'm not a clinician. I don't know which, if they would all be divvied out from the hospital pharmacy or not, but I would imagine that would be at least uh, one way of, of getting up, up that high. But again, it's, it's too soon to tell, because even, even uh, if it's 2009, 2010, when it, we started getting mandated to report, I mean, that data set's not going to be complete and ready for analysis, I'd say, for a little while. I might be wrong in that regard. Um, while it sounds like I'm teeing off on NMPAC, we have to remember it was only started in 2006, so I should give it a break. We should give it some time. Um, perhaps it'll improve with time like the NZCA and, and NMDS, which have been around for donkeys. Um, it's, it's a really good start, but again, it's, it, it needs improvement. So back to what we needed. My cohort, the comorbidities, and their treatment. Now, again, I took those chemotherapy and radiotherapy data knowing that you know, it's, not, it's not perfect, but it's the best that we can get. Ultimately, we need to know their survival, which brings us to the mortality data set. It's a collection of all deaths that were registered uh, each year in New Zealand and identifies the underlying cause of death. Primary sources of, death, uh, of data are births, deaths and marriages, other routine data sets like the NMDS and NZCR, and non-routine data sources, for example, the police. It includes data on the departed, 
So the age at which they died, their domicile co, where they were residing when they passed away, their ethnicity, etc. The quote-unquote event, so the date and facility of their death, plus who certified the death. Uh, and also their cause of death, so this underlying cause of death, um, for example, breast cancer as opposed to a patient dying of a heart attack. It also has other contributing causes of death, but um, from what I've discovered, there are two key fields that you can get from the mortality data set that are robust and complete, and that's state of death and underlying cause of death. Everything else seems to be sporadic, sporadically filled. So relying on the mortality data set to tell you all of the other contributing causes of death that the patient had, I don't think is a very valid approach. But it does have those two very good fields. For C3 quant, we're using the mortality data set to calculate our survival. So for example, Kaplan-Meier analysis, using it in our Cox proportional hazards models, and also to adjust our comorbidity indices. Not all comorbidities are equal they can be weighted by their effect on a patient's one-year mortality. For example, a patient with a pulmonary embolism is going to have uh, as a greater threat to their one-year survival than a patient who has uh, their sleep disorder. As an example of the mortality data, our breast cancer patient, uh, completely fictitious, even though I got marginally sad when I made up their death, uh, <laughs> our breast cancer patient passed away on the 10th of August 2011 at Mary Potter Hospice, just over the road. Their underlying cause of death was listed as their breast cancer, um, and we had uh, their insulin-dependent diabetes as a contributing uh, condition. But as I said, that field will be sporadically filled from my perspective. So strength of the mortality data collection. It is a complete record of registered deaths in New Zealand, and so it's a valid source, da uh, source of data for our survival analysis. It's required to be standardised to fit into this World Health Organisation uh, mortality collection. I don't know if that's necessarily a strength, but it sounded good, so it sounded like a strength to me, so I put it there. But it, does, it at least tells you that there is some sort of standardised criteria that they do have to fit. As far as weaknesses are concerned, underlying cause of death is open to interpretation and change. Conditions could be reclassified from one disease group to another over time. So if you tried to track um, the specific cause of death by code, you might miss some if they were reclassified into other disease groups. And there is a long time delay between year of death and release of mortality data set. This is more of a logistical consideration. But for C3, the provisional 2009 mortality data was only just made available. Now, best reports are that that's going to improve and that uh, hopefully even by the middle of this year we might have 2010 data. But it still gives you an idea of uh, some frustration that can happen around having these data sets complete. I had a chat with uh, someone at the ministry and they were saying essentially the longer you wait for the data sets, the more complete and robust they'll be. And that's, that, is, that is fair enough to say, but if you want your research to be relevant, you want the data sort of reasonably soon. Getting to the ways to augment routine data. Obviously, this, for the C3 data set, we are acutely aware of the problems with the routine data and don't want to have to rely on them entirely. So we want to do everything we can to augment the data sets. I've already touched on the clinical notes review that uh, Virginia Signal went around the North Island and did, 780 notes, no mean feat. Um, and it's as close as we can get to the gold standard for routine hospitalisation data. If you think about it, not only can you go in and pull out exactly what you want to pull out, you're taking away extra layers of filtering. So you're, you're literally getting the thing that a clinical coder looks at before they code what's going into these routine data sets. But it has its weaknesses, it's expensive. It's time consuming and it requires specialised skills. Virginia uh, was an oncology nurse by trade, so she could go out and do these things and understand uh, the notes. She, also, she would also tell you it takes a lot of detective work, so a lot of sleuthing to kind of figure out what happened to these patients and where she needed to get extra bits of information from. But if you want to do a clinical notes review, we know a really good one, so we know a really good person to do it. Um, with respect to more routine administrative data sets, or other routine data sets, we accessed a, a number of other cancer databases for C3. And now you've seen some of them already. Uh, all of the North Island cancer centres, including the sort of unofficial cancer centre of uh, Tauranga and Bay of Plenty, provided us with treatment data as best as they could. We also got the Auckland and Waikato breast cancer registers on board, which were very helpful. There is a breast cancer register in Wellington, as well as one in uh, Canterbury. 
Uh, but they were outside of our years of interest. They've only sort of started reasonably uh, lately, if you get what I mean. And also that uh, unnamed major Auckland private hospital database that was uh, so helpful to us in terms of particularly colon cancer and uh, gynecological cancers for finding definitive surgical treatment. Um, and also, the more clinicians you know, the better, because they have their own databases. I mean, it would be a mammoth task to try and find every clinician and get all their databases, but if you're wanting to augment your data set and you know a few good clinicians that might have treated that patient, it might be worth asking them. Again, it may provide more detail than the Ministry of Health data sets, but a weakness that could have kind of sprung to mind for me was accountability. Now, the Ministry of Health are accountable. They have set tasks that they have to do and they have to perform by law. But who gets in trouble with these other databases if there's data missing? I mean, no one, right? They might have their own internal processes around this, but ultimately, uh, no one really gets in trouble. So, quickly, looking to the horizon. There are changes, and, and Tony highlighted the fact that this is kind of a fluid uh, environment. These data sets are getting better. Uh, this is going to be a completely irrelevant presentation in 12 months' time, right? I'll have to update it. Uh, there are changes being made to the cancer registry based on, well, there's supposedly changes being made to the cancer registry based on the report that came out a couple of years ago, which is dri now driven by the Cancer Control New Zealand, which is sort of a wing of the Ministry of Health. And the key changes are some of those uh, address... They were not like you saying Okay. saying it anyway. <laughs> so there's this wing of the Ministry of Health called Cancer Control New Zealand. <laughs> so in this wing, they, uh, no, but they, they, are, they want to address some of those key issues that I've raised, right? So the staging issue. There's this big problem that we're discussing in the research group at the moment, but mapping between extent of disease as it's recorded in the cancer registry and TNM staging. So you have to map those somehow. Uh, so getting improved recording of stage of diagnosis would be massively beneficial in that regard. Also, improved recording of data from the private sector. I'm not, unless you mandate something like that, I'm not entirely sure how they're going to do that, but maybe they will. be excellent if they do. And also improving accessibility to data. And again, we have our fingers crossed about that. Um, to sort of finalise the... Blue sky looking with my two cents. There's this great data set, a uh, great registry called the Danish National Patient Registry. Um, I wrote this possibly the best database of its kind in the world and then looked at who the author was that said that, and I think they were one of the people that set it up, so I don't know if there's a conflict of interest there, perhaps. Uh, but but it is a very, it's known to be very robust, and it does, uh, of key importance, it does contain all inpatient and outpatient diagnoses and treatments. Private facilities in Denmark are mandated to report. So essentially what you have in our context is you have the NMDS, the NMPAC, and data from all non-reporting facilities in one data set. And population size or anything like that is, is no excuse because Denmark has a similar population size to New Zealand. I know it's not, all the way, it's not everything is the same, but its existence proves that data linkage is possible on that sort of national scale. So my two cents is that this is the sort of thing that we need to move towards. In conclusion, one strength kind of offsets one weakness, if you get what I mean. Very complete for some measures, but very incomplete for some measures. It's relatively cheap and available, but reporting varies by region, time, and variable. The take-home message is, despite some failings, routine data sets do allow us to do research that would otherwise be logistically implausible, I almost wrote impossible, but I stuck with implausible, or cost prohibitive. I mean, you think about what we can actually do. Instead of having to go out and do a notes review, the things we can do are pretty amazing. But we just have to be aware of the caveats that come with those data sets that we want to use. And I always ask ourselves, is this data set a valid means of answering my research question? And I think as long as we address those caveats, it's, it's, uh, it's a reasonably good source of epidemiology data. Uh, as a shameless plug, we're running a, a summer school course, the Cancer Control and Screening Research Group is running a summer school course uh, next year looking at uh, routine healthcare data in New Zealand concepts and application. So, uh, it's going to be, a, I think, get good buy-in by all the people that need to use this sort of data set and definitely expand on some of the topics that I've been using today. And Everybody is welcome to come. Just want to acknowledge the department, HRC, who funds uh, both of the C3 studies. Ministry, who are always um, very happy to discuss any problems. 
Uh, and James and Gordon also for sitting down with me. Probably forgotten already, but a few months ago we sat down and talked about this for a couple of hours or so. So thank you all. And happy to take any questions. <laughs> Must talk fast. Thank you, Jason. That was a fantastic overview of routing data in New Zealand and uh, you know the uses, weaknesses, and strengths. Um, happy to take any questions, Michael. Thanks, Jason, for that tour, of course, of our data collections, and it's great to hear the presented, I guess, from the researchers' perspective about their strengths and weaknesses. I guess I sort of had a question or a comment really about, you know, our typology for describing these routine collections. And I think, obviously, there is a spectrum. And I know we started, like most countries, with our vital statistics, which is obviously the mortality collection. And over the years, we've added all these administrative data, but it's some which are very sophisticated, like the NMPS. I just have a question really about where the cancer registry fits in that. It doesn't strike me as that it's set up for administrative reasons. It struck me as actually set up partly for research and surveillance reasons. So it's possibly needs to be thought about a bit differently. But I also want to mention there's a new tier of data sets that are coming in which are completely different in how they operate, and these are the you know, electronic patient records. So something like the immunization uh, database is an interactive database that's online. Basically, it's designed for managing patients, yeah. but also supports research. Yeah. So it, it behaves completely differently from all these other yeah. uh, collections. And similarly, the early warning system is the same. It's yeah. something that's flagged yeah. for people. And it's interactive, so you can actually, clinicians can use it to support decisions. Yeah. And also, it, it provides um, <clears throat> aggregate data. Yeah. So I just think it's quite useful to think about this sort of typology yeah. of different data sets. And in the future, we may well have the electronic patient record, which has everything mm. connected to the person. And arguably, New Zealand is already there. We just have to add more and more stuff onto it. So mm. we have the NHI. Mm. So we all actually have an electronic patient record. We're just not linking mm. everything to that event yet. Mm. And of course, um, you probably heard Health Tracker, which is, mm. I guess, um, the ministry is starting to get to that point where it is starting to link everything together about individuals. Mm. So. Um, obviously, <clears throat> there's a lot of developments in this area, and mm. with um, um, information technology advancing so rapidly, mm. I mean, New Zealand's very well placed to be a world leader in this area. Absolutely. Went to the uh, health informatics course, summer school course, and, and had some good presentations to that effect. The health tracker um, is an, a really interesting one that uh, Di and I went and met with uh, Craig Wright at the Ministry about, and we, we actually really wanted to use it. Um, for hours, but it was it was outside of our spectrum of interest, wasn't it? In the end. Yeah, I mean Tony's using it a lot. Um, we're using it in the Vogue program. It, it's based on all these, so all the data limitations that we have mentioned apply. It's a very, it's an amazing database, but it's good to be thinking about what the data were collected for originally. As it, so as you say, thinking about why they were collected, because of course <coughs> the strengths and weaknesses very closely reflect the purpose for which the data were collected. And in fact, um, it's interesting what you say about the immunisation database and things like that being a, sort of something to, to be used as a, as a patient management tool. In some respects, that's where Cancer Control New Zealand want the, the cancer registry, the sort of direction that they want in the cancer registry to go, to be more interactive and available for um, clinicians. It's a long way off that yet, but that's kind of the direction yeah. that they're kind of thinking of it going in. I completely agree that the cancer registry is as close to being researcher friendly as any of the other collections at this time. I mean, it really is. It's and we speak reasonably highly of the cancer registry, but it does have those issues that need to be uh, worked out. But it, you know, it's it's far closer than say the NMPAC having purchased Unicode. It's not about the money. It's about describing the concept, you know, describing this patient's cancer and what's what's going on. There's, there's an interesting tension at the moment on the cancer collections. So within the ministry, um, it's going more of the health tracker route, of trying to aggregate out, particularly from the South Island, a lot of data that's connected through the cancer services and build that up to a bigger system. So for example, you're trying to get radiotherapy, there's a lot of data that gets entered and sent out electronically, and that makes quite a nice collection because Meanwhile, Cancer Control New Zealand is trying to do it another way, and what they're what they are, and they're not trying to, they are not trying to be because they've got word of the minister. Um, there's a um, new website where clinicians will be required 
to enter the clinical stage of data that's needed to flat straight into the next rich street, um, as well as that trying to increase the quality of the smog pathology, and also try and be consistent basically with clinicians, as far as you go clinicians, we do try and align with their other pathological risks, um, to access the data real time so that we can just have all the data back out of it against the rich street. So there's these two parallel streams of activity going on. Right? Mm. It'd be very interesting to see where they can do. Richard. Hi, thanks, Jason. That was an incredible clear description of these data sets. I just got a couple of specific questions about the cancer registry. There was one thing you said about requiring histological diagnosis. Um, uh, so the implication I got from that was that if there's no histological diagnosis, then you don't put on the registry. And that seems because obviously there are some cases where there's a clinical diagnosis of pretty clear new cancer, but either for reasons of being elderly or the difficulty of doing the getting histology can't get it. That, that seemed to be a bit of a mission and I guess that could vary by different information groups as well and like they've created some biases within the system. So that I just wondered if you could comment on that. And the second question was the staging. Again, I, I just wondered for some of those cancers it seemed incredibly low. And yet um, you know, there's an enormous amount of clinical focus on getting the staging right is my, my impression. So is is that because the staging is is this a clinical problem or is it because the clinical data is not being translated into the cancer registry? So the information is there, but it's, but it's not being translated into a code. Yeah. I think that's what you'll probably answer those questions. Do you want to make um, yeah, yeah, so for the first one, uh, from my understanding, is all primary cancers are registered, but if they're not histolo they can be histologically confirmed or not. Most of them are, but the, the, as far as we're told, but if they aren't, that, that might actually feed into the extent of disease stuff. So you might have a field that has lab um, code or whatever, and the lab code is unknown because it wasn't histologically confirmed, but it will still be registered. So there shouldn't be any differential coming through. Does that make sense? So it's just that the, the primary source of data from pathology labs, so they, they get in sort of quickly, but then they also then review hospital notes and mortality records and other records to sort of fill in the gaps to get the non. So that they do get both, and they do not whether they were So for example, the NMDS data set, a cancer diagnosis might be made, and if uh, you know, that they might use that as the method from which the cancer registry diagnosis is made. But, yeah, so there shouldn't be any differential coming through there. Um, yeah, do you want to take on the second question? I can't remember what it was now. Staging. Staging. Why, why is this Maybe staging? I'll bring up the, because um, it's, it's actually a, yes. a very interesting topic of discussion and also a, a paper that we're writing up at the moment. I, I think I think the answer is that it's um, both the, the clinical complexity of staging, so the group of cancers where they've got very low proportion staged, there's a combination of factors. There's the complexity of staging, so it's very clinically staged, staged and it takes a long time, and those data don't necessarily make their way to the cancer registry. Even if those staging procedures take place, they're not always recorded clearly in the notes, so there's, even before it gets to the cancer registry, there's issues there. So... Um, Virginia, when she was going around doing a notes review on, on the cancers that are poorly, the poor stage data, she wouldn't be able to stage them from the data available, so she would send all the data to a um, hepatobiliary surgeon, and he wouldn't be able to stage them from the data that was available. So the data is just not in there. Um, and there was another point I was going to make, which has gone straight out of my head. If you look at our three um, notes review cancers, you can see why we went. So this is rectal cancer, stomach cancer, and liver cancer. Um, I should mention none of the other cancers are in the C3 state. They're all in this nice little bottom group. We but, don't we don't know why there's this really nice, beautifully clustered three. Yeah. You know, it looks like you've made that data up because there's you know there's big gaps between yeah. these sort of three groups of cancer. So we're going to be taking this particular graphic to our um, clinical advisory group, which has cancer specialties, more specialties, to look at it and see if they can make sense of it. Because although we've gone got these vague ideas around complexity around staging and data and you know, what gets in there and what doesn't. It it's, doesn't entirely explain these really clear differences between these cancer types. So they may have some something wise to say on that. But we're working on looking at um, patient characteristics as well, because you've got the characteristics within a particular cancer site, and then you've got characteristics of particular patients, which may, may mean that they're less likely to be staged. So we're looking at both of those sort of things. Why are you trying versus surface? Why, why the huge not yeah. immediately obvious to me. No, it's not. No, exactly. So there's some, to some extent you can make sense of it, but then there's a whole lot of why why that one in particular. So it, we'll throw it back to clinicians and see if what, they can come up with What's quite unique and neat is that this is reasonably under-researched internationally. 
So there's a paper that came out last year from the SEER, S-E-E-R, um, using their data set, so it's like a couple of million people, it's a massive data set. And their, um, their staging was, uh, their prostate cancer, for example, was far lower, it was 15% or 8% or something like that. So this may or may not be a cancer registry specific thing, or we're closer to the mark, if you get what I mean, because you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. You were kind of dismissive of the contributing causes of micro um, So the underlying cause we accept has been reason the cause of the cause of that is reason to active, but the contributing ones you dismissed. But often they're going to be missing because there were no other contributing causes. What can you, you must have done some digging around this. Do you have a place to talk to like for you or something? Do you have an idea of how often a missing field is actually Genuinely missing because there was no other So, like the validity of the contributing? Yeah, yeah. You were making quite strong statements. <clears throat> I was, I'm a strong statement kind of guy. Um, no, so the answer is uh, <laughs> not. Black, <laughs> I'm going to a funeral, maybe I am. Um, so, uh, so, the answer is no, not yet, because the clinical notes review data is still being, the database is still being created. But that's one of the key questions that we'll be able to answer. It's kind of, uh, for us principally, the underlying cause of death is the most important field there because we're getting the other contributing causes of death from other data. So that's not so, well, if you get what I mean. So we're not saying that we're getting other comorbidities, I should say, from other data sets. But that's definitely one of the questions that we'll be able to answer. Anecdotally, what I've, anecdotally, what I've found is when I've looked at just a random subset of patients has been that there's been some key, you know, but what is a contributing cause of death? You know, if a patient has non-insulin dependent diabetes, that might not be listed as a contributing cause of death because they died of liver cancer. You know, it's, uh, yeah, sorry, Michael? Just offer some comment. When I talk to um, the people who manage this, they say that basically it's about a silly field. Um, it's optional to fill it out, and there's only certain conditions which are able to record it, that they're truly caused. And so someone's decided that yes, diabetes should be recorded and certain other things, but other things aren't even on the list. So it's somewhat meaningless, except for a very few conditions. And of course, if you have two contributing causes, someone has to decide whether. I'm not going to report the diabetes because there's a car crash or something else that was more important. So, no, I think you only have one. Oh, there's, there's, there's quite a few, but they name different things though, but um, there's lots of space to be filled and it's not filled. That's what, that's what yeah. my understanding has been. It's so different from hospitalisation where you are encouraged to record all of the conditions and everything or 20,000 things in the ICD manual can be recorded. Here we're contributing causes. There's a relatively short list of things that are recorded if they're present. And someone has just decided that they are conditions of interest. Plus, we know that it's generally junior doctors that are filling them out, and hundreds of junior doctors filling things out differently. We kind of just know that that's very likely to be um, highly variably filled out without knowing anything else. So I think that comes back to the understanding the caveats of the data. So we've under, we, you know, the underlying cause of death is always recorded, whether or not it's entirely accurate. I mean, that's to be decided, but it's always recorded, and all I know is that the contributing, there's a, there's a lot of empty fields for the contributing cause of death. And if, if you were going to use that as a method for looking at comorbid conditions present at the time of death, it would be pretty average, I'd say. Just to clarify, around the plant mass, you talked about how the plant mass is actually the into the pharmaceutical collections? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the idea is the hospital pharmacy. So pharmacies based in the hospitals that only provide uh, drugs to inpatients, that they'll be, or and outpatients, I guess, of outpatient services provided at the hospital, that they'll be included in the pharmaceutical collections. And I'm not 100% sure about when that started, or if it started regionally, or if they're breaking it out somewhere. Cancer stuff has started in hospitals. So right now, if you look at the farmhouse, Cancer treatments given in hospitals should all be in the Cancer treatments given. From 2010, I think, the um, chemotherapeutic agents, uh, you know, that, I mean, the, the hospital pharmacy agents, agents prescribed by a hospital, not prescribed. Dispensed. Dispensed, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So they started from then, theoretically. They sh I mean, it should be. Uh, I would imagine without looking at the data, it should be reasonably complete because they do keep a computerised record of dispensing the drug. You know, they do have to keep track of it. 
It's a bit like the, the, the community pharmaceutical data is pretty complete for the drugs that they're trying to capture, which are the ones that they, you know. With cancer treatments, they have to incentive that to get reimbursed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the principal driver of the farm's data set is get reimbursed. So unless the, also unless the chemotherapeutic agent is a subsidised chemotherapeutic agent, yeah, I have a suggestion, and it's one that I can take up 10 years ago. Clear salmon, which is involved in early work. We were doing around days, so it's not like this. It was in early work. And we came up with, in the, in the um, forum with the AA, but also this forum here too, is that we should, as researchers, be creating a log somewhere of all this type of information we've seen today, because it's the follow ups take beauty to get around this and stuff. So maybe rather than publishing papers and things in J about this type of thing, actually just setting up a a website mm. badged by AEA and the University of Tokyo, where you can describe and update each year mm. the, what the research you makes in other each day. So, for example, this, this group of yep. information here, yeah, is that something yep. you'd consider or what we well, it, 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 you to do? No, it actually is because one of the topics of uh, panel discussion, <laughs> Who's at, the panel? at which I want to. <laughs> <laughs> One of the topics at the panel discussion, of which I want you to be one of the panels, so I've said it at a public forum now, so you have to do it, um, is... <laughs> thanks, Tony. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> and thanks for that, Tony. And Michael, by the way, as well. Yeah, thanks, Michael. <laughs> we'll discuss that later. Um, is, is the formation of a Ministry of Health, or a discussion about the formation of a Ministry of Health or Routine Data Collection Users Group? And that could be, in any form, it could be a meeting, or it could be an online wiki, or it could be whatever. And that, I think that's really critically important because you think about the time investment and the money investment that C3's put into me getting up to speed about what this yeah, data is. How much money this country invests in the data and how much more we get out of it? Authors yeah. like Michael and me and you guys and yeah. people here use it. That's right. So I think that that might get by in. So that's one, going to be one of the sort of topics of discussion. And if, as a result of that panel discussion, there's quite a good amount of buy in from people who are coming to a course that they're obviously interested in the data. There's good buy in. I think there's no reason that. In the coming months after that, we can just set it up and go with it. On that note, I think it's a very good note to wrap things up. And thank you all very much for coming. And thank you very much, Jason, for a very clear and concise um, presentation. Thank you.